Good evening, my name is Bill Purcell, and I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and it's my great pleasure to welcome each and every one of you to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum, and to tell those who are gathered here in the forum with us tonight that you are joined by thousands of people who are watching tonight's program via the Institute of Politics website. And in the days and years ahead, you will be joined by many others who will watch through the process of our video files, which are maintained and provide access to all of the programs of the Institute of Politics since 1978. We pride ourselves on trying to bring programming to this forum that are central to the mission of this institute uh, since our beginning in 1966. And I think tonight you will see exactly such a program. In order to introduce our speaker tonight, it's my privilege to present Doug Rubin. He is now Chief of Staff to Governor Deval Patrick. He is, however, I think as many in this room will know, no stranger to our forum. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, uh, he turned around and came home uh, to Massachusetts, uh, was a student here at the Kennedy School where he received his master's in public policy. He's worked in legislative offices, congressional offices. He's worked in campaigns from the most local to presidential. Uh, he's had roles in those campaigns that range from the normal entry level positions to media consultants, chief strategist, campaign manager. It's worth noting here tonight in this place, here in the Kennedy School, that his thesis which won actually uh, the policy award, Poli was actually the formal title of our award is Pol Policy Analysis Exercise Award in 1997. It's the title that's most important, not the award. It was leveling the playing field, minority candidates running in majority white districts. His reputation and his history is as a calm strategist and advisor. He's a smart guy and he's prescient as I think you will see here tonight, it's my privilege to present to you Doug Rubin. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's, uh, it's an always an honor to come back uh, to the Kennedy School, and in particular tonight, to introduce our guest uh, speaker, Don Tapscott. I've had uh, the opportunity to work on a number of the principles that I think Don will talk about tonight, uh, both in the campaign of uh, Deval Patrick and at times successfully and sometimes unsuccessfully for the last two years in the governor's office, um, trying to implement some of the things that you'll hear tonight. And uh, I'm very excited about uh, listening to the speech. Uh, Don Tapscott is an internationally renowned authority on the strategic value and impact of information technology. He consistently identifies and explains the next business imperatives and defines the business models and strategies the new imperatives require. He's authored a number of books, one which I think is kind of a Bible for people in my business, which is Wikinomics, How Mass Collaboration Changes Everything. It's an international bestseller and something that we actually follow very closely in the governor's office. Uh, Don's new book, Growing Up Digital, How the Net Generation is Changing the World, explores how the first generation to grow up with the net is redefining today's workplace, marketplace, schools, family, and government. How they're basically how they're changing the world. Um, Don is uh, chairman of NGENERA Insight and an adjunct professor of management at the Joseph Rodman School of Management in the University of Toronto. And without further ado, just want to introduce Don Tapscott. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I'm delight delighted to be here today. Uh, the Kennedy School has been a good friend and partner of mine over the years, dating back to, uh, uh, to a collaboration that I have with, uh, with Joe Nye and have many good friends here, Jerry Meckling, uh, Elaine Kmart, John uh, Della Volpe, I think we're all in the audience. And we continue to collaborate with the school in work that I'm doing uh, called Government 2.0. And this is a multi-million dollar research project that's investigating how the new web, combined with a new generation of young people who think differently, are beginning to fundamentally change government. And in the next half hour, I'm gonna try and convince you of the following proposition that we are, in fact, moving into a second generation of government and democracy. Government in the sense of the business of government, and I'm not talking about e-gov or government online or paving the cow path or anything like that. I'm talking about a fundamental change in how we orchestrate capability to create public services and public goods. And uh, not to create and to deliver them. But I'm also talking about a change not just in government, but in governance, and in the relationship between citizens and the state 
and arguably in the nature of democracy itself. And then we'll have some time to get into a, a discussion about this. There are four big drivers uh, for change that are, that are causing this transformation to occur. And the first is the new web. And to, uh, to use the colloquial, which is probably not appropriate at this august institution, uh, this ain't your daddy's internet. The old web was based on HTML, which was a standard for the presentation of content, which is why during the dot-com period, everybody talked about websites and eyeballs and stickiness and clicks and page views. Content is king, which is why vis-a-vis -vis government, people talked about government websites, government portals, one-stop shopping, joined up government, putting government online, because that's what the web was about. It was a presentation platform. The new web is based on this thing called HTML, which is the standard for computation. The internet is becoming a global computational platform enriched with services. It's high bandwidth. It's location aware. It's multimedia, true rich media. And it's enriched with services. And it integrates in with traditional operations, IT operations, in private or government enterprises. And as such, it's creating a global platform for collaboration. So we're shifting from content to collaboration, point number one. Point number two is there's a new generation of young people who are growing up digital, and these kids are different. Who here is either under 30 or has children, grandchildren, nephews, or nieces under the age of 30? Would you just put up your, OK. Those of you who put up your hands, which of those kids use a computer connected to the internet? Hands, please, okay. Same group put up their hands twice. We have the first generation to grow up digital, and these kids are different. Uh, I started studying these kids about 15, 16 years ago when I noticed how my own children were effortlessly able to use all the sophisticated technology. And at first I thought, my children are prodigies. And, uh, but then I noticed that all their friends were like them, so that was a bad theory. So I started working with 300 kids, and it was a dozen years ago I published this book. It was called Growing Up Digital. Flash forward a dozen years, we now have the new web. Back then there was no MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. There wasn't even blogging. But I looked at how these kids were using the web, and they were using it differently than my generation was. I was accessing websites. They were using it as a platform for communication. Now, those are, so this is my new book, and it's just come out. Uh, if you've read the book, you'll see, and you're going to hear, a positive view of this generation. And um, this positive view is uh, not the common view. If you read the popular press, all these books that are out, uh, Gene Twenge, Generation, me, we've created a little army of narcissists. Here's a book by an English professor named Mark Berline called The Dumbest Generation, How the Digital Age Stupefies Young Americans and Jeopardizes Our Future. Don't trust anyone under 30, he says. So I just put a video blog up to kind of generate a little discussion on this. Let me play it for you, and then I'll respond to it. Hey, moron. If you're a teenager or in your 20s, you're part of the dumbest generation. And the reason? The internet. Digital immersion is hurting brain development. You're a generation that can't read, write, communicate, and you know nothing. Furthermore, you're net addicted. You're glued to the screen, and you're losing your social skills. You're also an overcoddled generation, and you mooch off your parents. You steal. You violate intellectual property rights with no consideration of the interests of the owners of music or other content. You're violent and you're a bunch of bullies. You're a generation that doesn't give a damn. You don't vote, you don't care. In fact, you're the narcissistic me generation. All you care about is your MySpace and your YouTube and your Facebook. And because of you, the future is hopeless. <laughs> Well, my name is Don Tapscott, and I've just conducted the definitive investigation of your generation, a $4 million research project. And I've come to the conclusion that all of these critics of youth today are basically making this stuff up. 
This negative and cynical view is not supported by data. You're not the dumbest generation, you're the smartest generation. And as you move into every institution in society, you're a powerful force for change, and change for the better. I hope that you find my new book, Grown Up Digital, okay, clear some to. mud <laughs> off the windshield. And I invite you to grownupdigital.com. I'd like to know what you think. Apologies for the advertisement at the end there. I'm a researcher. Let me give you some data. First of all, demographics. If you're born between 46 and 65, you're part of the baby boom, biggest generation ever. Then the birth rate dropped off for a period of 12 years as the boomers delayed having kids, first generation to do that. And around 1978, the boomers started having kids, and they produced this huge generation. Demographers called this a baby boom, the bust, sometimes called Gen X, the echo, echo of the boom. And you can see this in all kinds of data. This is school enrollment in the United States, boom, bust, echo. But we don't understand this, I don't think, as a society. We talk about the aging of a population. The population is not just aging, it's bifurcating. Go to the backup. Is that okay? All right. It's bifurcating. <laughs> and um, I just don't like podiums. And so, um, but we don't get this yet. We talk about the aging of a population. Um, well, if we understood this chart, we'd know why there are certain problems in society, like the schools being in crisis in America. Look at this chart. There's a huge wave of youngsters in the universities and um, uh, in the high schools. The eldest are now 30. They're in, into the work place in the marketplace. But we say, yeah, the school's in crisis. I know. What should we do? I don't know. Why don't we cut back on funding for education and then test kids more? Uh, maybe that'll help. Um, we don't understand this yet. This is sometimes called the boomlet. It's not a boomlet. The echo is louder than the original boom. There's 80 million of them in the United States in this demographic age, 13 to 31 inclusive. There's only 78 million baby boomers. So based on their demographic muscle alone, they're gonna dominate the 21st century. So that's why we should care on those grounds alone. But to me, what makes them a real force for change is not just their size. This is the first generation to be bathed in bits. Computers, the internet, interactive technologies are part of the experience of youth. I'm a digital immigrant, they're digital natives. And time online, is not taken away from hanging out with your friend, learning the piano, talking to your parents, or doing your homework. Time online is taken away from correct television. The baby boomers, their parents, watched 24 hours a week of TV when they were growing up. And these kids watch a lot less TV, and they watch it differently. They come home and they turn on their computer, and there are three different windows, and they've got three magazines open, and they're uh, uh, listening to MP3 files and talking on the phone, more likely texting on the phone. You and I talk on phones. They text, and uh, they have a video game going. Oh, yeah, and they're doing their homework as well. And the TV may be going on in the background, but the TV's sort of like ambient media. It's like Muzak. And when they're online, what are they doing? Well, rather than being the passive recipients of somebody else's video, as I was, for 24 hours a week, they're reading and organizing and authenticating and composing their thoughts and searching for stuff and telling their stories and having to remember things and even with video games, develop strategies. This is affecting the way a generation processes information and the way they think. Furthermore, television itself has changed. My son just graduated last year from a little liberal arts school called Amherst College in, here in Massachusetts. And um, I went and took a picture of him and his buddies watching TV one day. This was the picture. They had three televisions going in the room, and they each had a laptop. And they were playing this little game where they were betting if that was true, what someone just said on television. That's a little different than me sitting there watching you know, the Mickey Mouse Club or something like that in terms of cognitive development. Furthermore, this is the first time in human history when children are an authority about something really important. 
Think about that one. I was an authority on model trains when I was 11. Today, the 11-year-old at the breakfast table is an authority on this di digital revolution that's changing business, commerce, government, learning, and every other institution in society. So in the 60s, we had a generation gap, right? Big differences between kids and parents over values, lifestyle. This doesn't exist today. Kids and parents get along pretty well. Look at your iPod and your kid's iPod. There's overlap. My parents didn't even like the Beatles, let alone you know, the Doors or something. What we have today is what I call the generation lap where kids are lapping their parents on the info track. And if you've got a teenager in your house, you know what I'm talking about. Who does the systems administration in your home? So this is humbling, and we fear what we don't understand. This is a panel I did. It was a big audience, thousands of people. It's called the World Congress in IT. I've been doing many of these, the youth panels. And um, out of the mouths of babes, this is the highest rated session of over 100 at the conference. On the left there is Rahaf Harfouche, a Syrian studying in Paris. Her boyfriend's in Toronto to keep their relationship going. They turn on video Skype all day long. They cook together. I asked her, does your generation use email? And she says, no, Mr. Tapscott, that's email's yesterday's technology. And I said, well, what, if you did use email, what would you use it for? She says, email. That's sort of like a formal technology, say for sending a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents. That would be a good use of email, I, I guess. I put it to her. I said, aren't you the dumbest generation? You don't read the newspaper. You don't watch the TV, uh, television news. Don't you get your news from Jon Stewart in The Daily Show? Aren't you uninformed? Aren't we lost because of you? And she says, well, Gee, I don't think that's a fair stereotype. It's true, I don't read the newspaper. She says, putting it back to me. But if, Mr. Tapscott, have you ever seen one of those things? Like, they come out once a day. They don't have hot links, and you get this black stuff all over your fingers. She says, let me tell you about my RSS feeds. I have about 60 or 70 of them. I like to triangulate the news for my own opinions. I get the news all day long. She says, true, I don't watch the TV news. Nobody does. The average age is 59, Sam Donaldson said to me recently, the, the nightly news is dead. And Rahaf says to me, it's true, I watched The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, but not to get the news. I don't think The Daily Show would be funny unless you know the news. So that was just a case in point. I have a limited time here. I'll just mention uh, the other woman there is uh, Sherry Kong, 80. She's one of 80 students in New Zealand hired by the government to teach the teachers how to use the internet in the classroom. I said to her, so Sherry, what are the teachers like as students? She says, oh, Mr. Tapscott, I have to tell you, they're awful. Like they talk in class, they don't do their homework, giving out pink slips all the time. And uh, beside her is Michael Furtick, the granddaddy of them all. He's uh, 26. I've known him since he was 12 when he was the project manager on my website. Uh, growingupdigital.com. They made him the project manager as a 12-year-old because he was the oldest and most experienced on the team. When he was 15, his on-site was getting 20 million page views a month, and he sold it for an undisclosed seven or eight-figure sum. Uh, one of the news reports said it was only a million dollars, and I sent him a note. I said, Michael, you sold it for a million dollars. You should have called me, and he wrote back and said, Don, legally, I can't tell you how much I sold it for, but I can tell you I'm very happy. And... Um, he didn't want the money to buy a Ferrari, although he bought a cheap little car, but his mom had to drive around with him because he only had his learner's permit. Um, he wanted the money to invest in his next venture. It's called takingitglobal.org, a social network of four million young people in 70 countries. These are kids who want to change the world. So is this bad for kids' brains? Well, two critical periods of brain development. Zero to three, it's not affected much by this. And Extended adolescence, 8 to 18. How you spend your time during adolescence after your DNA is the number one determinant of what your brain is like. I'm not talking about brain plasticity. We all have brain plasticity. I'm talking about the building of the brain. And if you watch TV for 24 hours a week, you get a certain kind of brain. And if you spend an equivalent amount of time as the active handler and user and collaborator and so on of information, you get a different kind of brain as well. 
Furthermore, we ask the kids, which would you rather be? This is 11,000 students. Would you rather be smarter or better looking? And if you take a one country, 80% around the world said smarter. There was only one country where they wanted to be better looking. <laughs> and uh, in the question period, I will not give you an interpretation of that data. If they're the dumbest generation, how come IQ has been going up year over year? That's our measure of dumb and smart. If they're the dumbest generation, how come even though the number of kids taking the SATs exploded when I was at 1978, it was only the smartest kids from the best schools that took the SAT. Now, it's a mass phenomenon. SAT scores should have crashed. They haven't. They've held their own, in some cases, even gone up. Now, there is a real problem, and I'll be frank with you. These are two shocking graphs if you put them together. The bottom graph is these are the, the top third of kids, the kids at Harvard, and the kids who are just doing spectacularly, graduating more from universities. There's no evidence that standards have gone down. If anything, they've gone up. The competition to get into schools is greater. And the top third are great. The middle third are doing pretty well compared to previous generations. And the bottom third are dropping out of school in the US and in other countries, Canada. Should we blame the internet? Well, how about the fact that class size are 40 and a teacher lasts 5.1 years and they're underpaid and the conditions are awful and the kids are coming to school hungry and the model of pedagogy is all wrong. There are real reasons why that bottom third is failing. And to blame the internet, it's sort of like blaming the library for ignorance, really. These people do a great disservice. And why um, I try in Grown Up Digital to be rational throughout the book, and in the last chapter, I apologize, I kind of lose it a bit. Because this is not helpful. There are real problems that we need to address. Now, how about the family? They're all coddled. We'll get to, we're, we're getting to politics, OK? Um, this is the org chart of the family I grew up in, the baby boomer family. Mom reported to dad, and the kids reported to mom. It was called Father Knows Best. There was a TV show to exemplify that dad was the CEO and chairman of the board. I was a kid number one in a family of five. That meant the dog reported to me. Um, if you have a family today, this is the org chart of your family. The kids in the center around are parents and step-parents, because a lot of families um, are, are split up. And uh, we got grandparents in on the action as well. You know what? 40% of them move home after they graduate. Gee, they go to school, they come home with an $80,000 debt. Uh, the economy's not exactly that great. They uh, get along great with their parents. Their parents love having them home. This is glass half full or half empty. Is there something wrong with that? Both of my kids moved in with us after they graduated. We had a deal, social contract. They had to do some stuff. But it was wonderful. But we interpret these things pejoratively. Kids are are internet addicted. Well, I used to read a lot when I was a kid. I wasn't reading addicted. We, we have pejorative interpretations of things that we don't understand. Oh yeah, and they don't give a damn? Uh, well, excuse me, but volunteering is at an all-time high for both high school and university students. And of course, civic activity has become uh, political activity. Uh, witness the fact that they were just instrumental in electing their first president. And they will dominate politics for the next half a century. So there are a bunch of real issues, you know, that, and I don't have time to go into them today. We need to address some real problems in our society and in our organization. It's a huge one being privacy, that a whole generation is blowing its privacy online. But it's not, this, this mean-spirited, cynical view of youth today is just wrong. OK, so you put those two together, and you have something new that Barack Obama uh, understood. You have the rise of, of a social platform and self-organization. I could show you 50 charts, and they all would look the same. They show the old HTML website in red being eclipsed by the XML-based community. The old one thought the internet's about websites and eyeballs and stickiness, and the new one understands it's about collaboration. The old one built a website, the new one built a vibrant community. 
So when I go on to Flickr and I name my puppy, as I did, Bernese Mountain Dog, that's an XML tag that links me up with 934 other Bernese Mountain Dog owners, and I'm in a community where I find out why my puppy eats sticks and has digestive problems. You can't do that with Kodak Easy Share. YouTube beats MTV. MTV's the old model. We're a presenter of content. Facebook beats Match.com. Wikipedia beats, uh, this is hardly fair, the back of the room there, I don't know if you can see, there's a little red line on the web that might be hard to see. So what's going on here? Well, I'll just tell you a, a humbling story. It was Christmas, and uh, two years ago, in a bit, I gave my son Alex an advanced copy of Wikonomics. And he was a junior at the time. He said, thanks, Dad. When I started reading the book, came back a couple hours later, said, hey, Dad, this is a good book. It's like he's surprised or something. And um, he says, I think I'll create a community on Facebook. I watch him do this. Six, uh, 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 50 minutes later, he has six members. Um, by the time reading Turkey on Christmas night, he has 130 members in seven countries, seven regional coordinators, a president, secretary, and chief information officer for the community. He sent out a PDF of the first two chapters of the book. I got kids writing in saying, uh, Mr. Tapscott, we found errors in your book. And the community is placing demands on me. Before I'm eating turkey, I get a kid writing and saying, how exactly is Mr. Tapscott going to be contributing to our community? <laughs> self-organization has been around throughout human history. Language was a function of self-organization. Self no central committee of the English language said this will be called a pad. It just kind of happened. Government was a function of self-organization. People got together because they understood they had some common interests. Well, what used to take place over millennia or centuries can now happen over months or weeks or in a single Christmas day. I, I never could have created a community of 130 people in, in seven countries, regardless of what I did. So this is changing the deep structure and architecture of our institutions. In the private sector, um, it was uh, 15 years ago, I came across this guy, Ronald Coase who had uh, previously won a Nobel Prize for a deceptively simple paper where he said, why does the firm exist? If Adam Smith is right in the open markets, the best mechanism to determine how goods and materials are, and people are organized, why, don't, why isn't everybody an independent contractor at every step along the way in production? He said the answer is transaction costs. And what he was referring to was collaboration costs. The costs of collaborating in an open market were greater than the cost of doing things inside the boundaries of the corporation, which is why we had vertically integrated corporations for the last century. Um, well, information technology and other things began to drop collaboration costs. Um, I called this a couple of decades ago, a book I wrote called Paradigm Shift. I said the organization, the enterprise is becoming extended. Then we had the rise of the internet and vertically integrated companies unbundled further into business webs. And now, collaboration and transaction costs are dropping so much in society that peers can come together and do things. Not just hook up online or create a gardening community. Social networking is becoming social production. So if you can create an encyclopedia with a million people, and the quality is just as good as the one created by the professors and Pulitzer Prize winners, what else could you create? Could you create an operating system? Linux is the dominant operating system for medium and large computers owned by no one. Linux has some big customers like China. Could you create a mutual fund? Could you create a physical good like a motorcycle? So this is taking us into a new age of participation where people can participate in the economy in ways that were previously unthinkable. You can not only watch the evening news, you can go on to Al Gore's current TV and create a news clip. Half of all of their content is now user generated. If you're a poor kid in Mumbai, you can go to MIT because they've opened up the courseware. You won't get a degree, but maybe you'll become a hotshot programmer and then you join the top coder network of 200,000 programmers around the world. You might be able to help um, you know, an insurance company in Boston uh, uh, re rebuild its computer systems. So extend this out now to government, and this is a time of very profound change. Change in 
two ways. We have a new generation. We need to win the war for talent in government. Well, there is no war for talent. We're in a recession. No. There may be a surplus of labor. There isn't a surplus of talent. And your government shouldn't look like Italy, demographically, as a country. Italy has no young people. Japan's worse. They have no young people, and they have a restrictive immigration policy. So they're different as employees. They're different as consumers. Oh, they want immediate gratification. Well, my daughter is a consultant. She commutes to Minneapolis every day. She can check into the Marriott Hotel for 30 seconds, and she wonders why it takes four weeks to get something from a government that's about as complicated. Is that immediate gratification, or do they have legitimate desires and needs for things to happen quickly? And so big changes for them as employees. I think they're changing the way we think about management. Big changes in terms of how services are delivered and created. Just like we have business webs in the private sector, we can have governance webs in the public sector. This is transforming healthcare. And the next step, of course, is when you're born, you ought to have a website, and that becomes your health record. And you control it, you have full access to it. Of course, there are all kinds of privacy and security considerations, and you're given all sorts of tools. So if you have diabetes and you have access to this fabulous, a lot of it user-generated information, and great tools, you will measure your blood sugar level, and we can maybe get the cost of healthcare down from 19% of the GDP and maybe get everyone insured. So this is not about putting government online. This is changing the way we think about the role of citizens in creating services. And there are all kinds of examples, and I can talk about those, um, governance webs. But let me get to the key point I wanted to make. I think that this is in the, we're in the early days of some profound changes to democracy itself. A new medium of communications that enables us to collaborate the rise of a new generation for whom all of this is like the air and who are natural collaborators, the rise of a of, of social organization in a profound new way, leading to big changes in the, in the deep structures of, of our institutions, what does this mean for the nature of democracy itself? Well, we, we, we saw it changes elections. And this was not about you know, raising money differently or 12 million custom email addresses or something like that. Something much more profound happened in that election campaign. It changed the way that people decide and think about the issues. You know, back in the old days, like four years ago, if, uh, if Katie Couric had interviewed Sarah Palin and she came off looking quite inept, people might have forgot about it a couple of days later. More people watched Katie Couric interview Sarah Palin on the web by far than they did on television. But something even bigger was occurring. And I came across this in a funny way. It was a couple of years ago. Somebody sent me an email saying, there's a senator running for, for, for uh, the, uh, 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 the leadership of the Democratic Party. His name's Barack Obama. And he thinks your book, Wikonomics, is the key to changing politics. And I thought, well, that's kind of cool. And I went there. And sure enough, there's this Wikonomics community in the Obama campaign that it organized. And I thought it was pretty hot stuff there for about two minutes until I realized there was also a firefighters community for Obama. And there was a single moms who support daycare for Obama community. And soon, it was hundreds back then, soon 35,000 communities. MyBarackObama.com was not a website. It was a context whereby people could self-organize. And this social movement propelled him. And youth were at the heart of it. Did you watch the, his dutiful 10 speeches to the inauguration balls? The one where he got really engaged and animated was the youth ball. And basically, he said, thank you. You brought me to power. Well, young people only made a difference in two states. People m miss the point. First of all, uh, Hillary Clinton would have been a, the candidate if he'd lost Iowa, but the, he won the youth vote seven to one in Iowa. And even though Hillary Clinton and John McCain beat him in the 30 plus vote that people always care about, he won the youth vote so strongly that he won Iowa. But more important,
this social movement affected all different demographics and different generations. And it was the engine, I will argue to you, of his victory. Now, this is also changing the way that we access information. This is uh, Anthony Williams, my co-author on Wikinomics, uh, found this thing called you work, uh, They Work For You.com. This was his member of parliament when he was living in London. He was at the LSE. And we can go and find out about George Galloway's voting record, committees and topics of interest, recent appearances, numerology, uh, expenses. We can find out what the good member had for lunch and who paid for it. Now, there's a side to this that is a bit much. But as a politician, you're going to be naked. And you know something? Sunlight is the best disinfectant, I think, especially in countries that have graft and corruption. It's a big problem. So as a politician, you're going to be naked. And if you're going to be naked, fitness is no longer optional. Or you better be buff. So transparency, you hear um, the president talk about it a lot. I think he understands that transparency is central to the new model of ruling. The really big one, though, is that this is not just changing the way we win elections. It's changing the way we rule and the way we govern. Imagine if the president stood up after the inauguration and said to 10 million people, largely young people, who were online and who were influential and somehow engaged. If he said, thanks a lot for getting me elected. Now, you go be passive for four years, and then we'll get to do it all over again. That may be appropriate for my TV generation, where we were the passive recipients of media, but not for a generation that's grown up interacting and collaborating and searching for things and authenticating and being engaged. So if we can have a discussion of 40,000 people for Habitat Jam over a three-day period, I call it a digital brainstorm, and if IBM can have a discussion for four, uh, 400,000 IBMers and their families over a three-day period called the Innovation Jam, where they came up with the 10 best big ideas for IBM, can we have a discussion of 4 million people in, um, in Massachusetts or 40 million people in the United States? Technology's there. Well, there are all kinds of problems. There'll be saboteurs. There'll be uh, people who don't have access. There'll be um, you know, this and that. These are all, to me, in the category of implementation challenges. They're not in the category of reasons why we shouldn't reinvent the model of democracy. Now, to be clear here, I'm not talking about direct democracy. We have representative democracy for good reason. Ross Perot in the electronic town hall, you get to vote every night on the evening news. That's a bad idea. Democracy is a lot more than majority rule on a nightly basis. One of the things it's about is uh, protecting the rights of minorities. But what would happen if we had a discussion in America about a problem over three days? Pick the problem. Climate change, how to turn back global warming, how to uh, fix the economy, to re repair America's reputation in the world, whatever. Imagine what would happen. People would become engaged. They would learn. It's not about politicians broadcasting to citizens or citizens telling politicians what to do. It's about having a conversation. Initiatives would be catalyzed. Good things would happen. It turns out a digital brainstorm is one of a dozen things. There are policy wikis and, and, uh, and contests. Sounds hokey, but the X Prize is a huge critical in initiative. Richard Branson's given $20 million to spur research into um, uh, 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 the whole problem of, of carbon. We've got the Green Party in, in Canada created its policy on a wiki. We've got all citizen portals. There are all kinds of exciting initiatives that could be undertaking. So I'll just close by saying, I think we are in the early days of some big changes. Um, not just the government and how we operate a government and create services, but to governance itself. Is it possible we're moving to a model that's more participatory, where citizens, rather than, becoming, uh, rather than being passive consumers, become much more active? This is the way we describe it uh, in our program. In the first wave, democracy, elected officials, uh, we established elected officials and accountable institutions, and this was so important, 
many countries don't have this. But a weak public mandate and an inert citizenry. In the second wave, though, this will be characterized by a strong representation and a new culture of public deliberation based on active citizenship. Wow. You look at the world and all of the problems that we have. This is a time of great peril. But what a time of opportunity as well. So you put all that together, and it does feel disruptive. And I'm working with government leaders, some heads of state and heads of states or regional level governments around the world. And I can count on a couple of hands the ones that I think really get it and want to move forward with this. But as they start to implement these, and, and, and um, uh, I'd actually put your, uh, your governor, Governor Patrick, in that uh, category. But as we move forward and, and these uh, innovators um, implement new models, we're going to see some change happen very quickly. It's understandable that people resist all this. This is, if I may use that term, a paradigm shift. And when you get one of these, you get a crisis of leadership. Vested interests fight against change. Leaders of the old are often the last to embrace the new. How are we going to find leadership? Well, all of you care about these things, and leadership can come from anywhere. Head of state, rare. Um, typically, it starts somewhere by somebody who just gets it, and then it extends out. Uh, I welcome you to join uh, grownupdigital.com. And I will mention one thing. This, uh, about the dumbest generation uh, to close. I'm debating uh, this guy, Mark uh, Bearline, um, and, and it's a bit risky because this is being televised on the net. He might be watching this. But this is a, a line that I'm going to use in my debate um, sooner or later. And it's going to go like this. Well, let's define dumb and smart. Dumb would be you write a book called The Dumbest Generation. You don't go and buy the website of the same name. Smart would be like the 20-year-old in my office who saw I was debating this guy and wondered, did he secure the URL? Goes online for $50, buys thedumbestgeneration.com, gives it to me. And now if you go to thedumbestgeneration.com, you go to a discussion that I'm hosting. <laughs> so, thank you. We're going to uh, take questions from the audience now. Um, I guess there are three rules um, in the Kennedy School Forum. Um, uh, obviously, um, identify yourself, uh, try to be brief, and make sure that the statement ends with some kind of question. Um, I think I got that right, right? So anybody? Questions? Steve Patterson. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, technologist. Uh, but the question I've got is, is the real resistance to this government 2.0. If you imagine what um, a significant amount of money could do creating a I want to be elected website that takes away all the power of the parties and allows any registered voter to become a candidate and, and has the power and reach. Uh, this, the second is, is, is what if, uh, uh, noticing the, the website in, in the UK, about they work for us, what if we had eBay-like reputation keeping on, 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 on politicians? And I think these two things are probably obstacles to, to, to really opening, opening it up and gain support. So I'd like to see your thoughts on that. Well, it's a great question, and we could talk about this for a while. Um, really briefly, uh, what you're talking about is this concept of disintermediation, that when information flies through these networks of glass and air at the speed of light. And when people become engaged, everything in the middle is challenged and can go away. But there's a flip side to that, a term I've used called re-intermediation, that the opportunities to create new value in the middle are actually bigger than the old displacement. So take political parties. Political parties used to be the foundation of the discussion of ideas, the founding fathers. It was the marketplace of ideas where real things got debated. Now political parties in some countries have become institute, uh, institutions for raising money and fielding candidates, really. And there's a real need for people to have discussion about ideas. So if political parties don't step up, 
to their original mission, they will be displaced. And they are being displaced now in the countless forums where ideas are being discussed. Um, we could say the same thing about government services. Um, Google, right now, is in many ways creating key components of government services. Because government information is so inscrutable and hard to access, um, governments over the years have, made a, uh, have found it very difficult to open up. So Google is now opening them up. And uh, if you go to uh, 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 Google uh, government, you'll see all kinds of capabilities that looks like what governments ought to be doing. Be and maybe it's a good thing that Google does this. Maybe there are some problems that Google does as well. So this is a challenge to every institution. You need to create value. And if you don't, you become irrelevant. And, and other, um, other, other, uh, uh, other movements and elements uh, can replace you. I'll just give you one, because I'm, I'm, we're at Harvard here. You know, it's, it's a big thing among many of the smartest university students to get an A and never go to the lecture. Because the lecture, hey, I'm a teacher, I have knowledge, you're a student, you're an empty vessel, you don't get ready, here it comes. Uh, and you should take it into active working memory and, and be able to recall it to me when I test you. I mean, that's a bit of a harsh stereotype. But, um, you know, it's not just the prof that has knowledge anymore. Students can get access to knowledge in other ways. So we need to reinvent the whole model of pedagogy and the whole model of learning for relevance and, and for effectiveness in, in the 21st century. So this is a big challenge to every one of our institutions. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ryan Buckley. I'm a second year student here at the Kennedy School. Um, it's really excited that you're bringing this topic in because I'm expecting to work for a uh, gubernatorial candidate in California after I graduate doing new media internet strategy for him. And just on a quick aside, I noticed he hadn't registered his name <laughs> um, so I bought it. <laughs> um, so I'm, it's really interesting what you talked about, what went on in 2008. I'm curious what you anticipate in terms of new media strategy um, for the next cycle in 2010. For the election? Yeah, statewide. I mean. Yeah. Well, the cat is out of the bag. The train has left the station. The horse is out of the barn. Everyone knows that your digital media strategy shouldn't be an add-on your campaign, but it's going to be at the center of your campaign. And that the old model of, I'm a politician, well, let me do it the same thing as the educator, OK? I'm a politician. Listen up to this 30-second negative ad where I attack my opponent around an issue, if you're young, that you could care less about. Then you go vote for me, and then we're going to do this. I'm going to broadcast you for four years, and then we get to do it. I mean, this is not going to work. And uh, uh, John Delavolpe. Where is he? Yeah, right here in the audience. I mean, John could give us the, the data, and, and he understands as, as good as anybody in the world. Um, but this is a massive voting block that will dominate politics. And it's not going to be like two decades from now. It's like in two years, they're going to be that much bigger. And, um, and in two, uh, two, by 2015, that, that time frame, they're going to be the largest voting block. And they learn about stuff differently, like television advertising. Do you know that uh, in my research, 60% of TV ads by people in this demographic in the US, they cut them out. That old saw, half of my ads work, I just don't know which half. I can guarantee the 60% that they cut out, those ones don't work. The ones they never see don't work. So this is going to be a huge change. Now, but what's even more interesting to me is that this is not just about elections. It's changing the way that we rule. And I think that, that Obama and the people around him are smart enough to understand that this, is, this movement is not a liability, like many people are saying these days. Oh, he's got a tiger by the tail. How, how's he going to keep the, the how, how do you keep him down on the farm after they've seen Paris? He's going to need a social movement to bring about change. And this may be a controversial thing to say, but real change doesn't happen in back rooms and in negotiations. It comes about from a change in the relationship of forces in society, where different groups, different parts of society gain power and knowledge and influence, and they're able to change things. Look at something like healthcare. 
to fix this problem, it won't be done in a back room. It will be an epic battle where there will be winners and losers. And if he's smart, he'll understand that he's going to need a social movement to help him win. So that's a very different way of thinking about how you govern, that, that citizens shouldn't be inert, that it's in everyone's interest for them to be active. Yes. My name is Michael Brower. I'm a graduate of this school before it became the Kennedy School. Uh, it was the Litauer School back then. I've been active in American politics since Adlai Stevenson in 1956 and John F. Kennedy in 1960, and including this recent campaign of Barack Obama. I am absolutely blown away by the potential that you have laid out for us tonight. My question is, will there be DVDs available? I have a friend who has created a web portal called Global Responsibility. I want to get one for him and one for me. I will buy your books, but I want to send him a DVD. Is that possible? This is all going to be on the web. It's, it's, it's on the web right now. Good. In fact, say hello to all those people out Good. there who are. Thank you. If you want to get my book, the way to do it is in massive volume. <laughs> volume. You look like someone with friends. No, sir. I'm just kidding. OK. Uh, my name is Evan Hutchison. Sorry. Uh, I'm a first year student in the MPA program here at Kennedy. I blew it. Um, anyway, thank you for including me in the net generation. I just turned 31 yesterday. and. <laughs> Makes me feel a little bit younger. Um, but first of all, what I'm interested in, I don't know if there's any research going on right now, but is there, has anyone tried to correlate engagement in like Facebook groups and things like that with the Delta and voter turnout? Um, you know, looking at those who maybe were 22 this time and were 18 last time and didn't participate, you know, this time they engaged via the web. I mean, has anyone been doing any sort of controls over that or, or research? Or is in terms of controlled research, I don't know, John. Did did you, this is a correlation between. Well, everybody talks about how all this stuff's changing political participation, yeah. but in terms of, you know, I haven't seen any hard <coughs> data that engagement through a Web.20 social networking thing increases your likelihood to, to vote or. Well, I'll start this off, and John might want to pick it up, because what I'm going to say, I learned from him, um, that from the Institute of Politics, our host tonight. But um, uh, political activity with Gen X was low, which is where we got the stereotype that youth aren't involved. And it started to change with young people, in particular around 9-11, whereas the new generation of young people started to conclude, actually, the state's important. And through, this sounds a bit unfair, uh, but I'm not sure it is, um, one of the reasons they became engaged was because of George Bush. And this will be part of his legacy, that a, a generation um, decided that who's in government matters. And uh, so they, they got involved in civic activity. As I said, uh, this is at an all-time high now in the United States. But this, this sort of uh, Ronald Reagan, um, Margaret Thatcherian view that the best government is no government is not held by this generation. They understand that there's a role for government. In fact, um, now, this data is a year old, and I can hardly wait till the new data comes out, but in terms of the top 10 organizations you'd like to work for, um, a year ago, uh, half of them were NGOs or governments. And I, I think the number one or two choice for undergraduates from Harvard is to go to something like Teach America. So it's a generation that has very deep values, and they care a lot. And so they should. I mean, you look at the world, and they're imagining the future. Gee, we. We need to reindustrialize the planet. We have 30 years to do that. Uh, this is not about buying a Prius or something. We, um, the whole global financial system is in tatters, and we're into some kind of thing that we don't really know what it is. I mean, a Harvard uh, economics prof, I read an article the, this morning where he said, this is a time of potential revolution. This is not about unhappy people. This is about whole parts of the world where millions, tens, hundreds of millions of people can become very political and not do it through the traditional um, uh, apparat apparati that we have. So um, uh, there, the good news is that 
if people become engaged, if we can listen to them, if we can learn from them, and this is the first time in history where we can actually learn from young people, then in their culture is, I think, the new model of what a government ought to be. In their culture is the new model of work. In their, in their behavior as citizens is perhaps a new model of a network society. And if we listen to them, weirdly, uh, children can help show us the way forward. I don't know, John, did you want to add anything to that? The only thing I'll add, and I apologize, I was actually, um, my son was texting me while you were speaking, <laughs> which I lost attention for one moment. And you're um, not as good a multitasker as he is. Exactly. Um, but the other change I think that technology is bringing is the cost per acquisition of a voter, right? And so there is an effect. So, so you could hardly blame an elected official in the 90s who wasn't communicating with young people because they're hard to find, they weren't paying attention, they weren't voting, and it's expensive. Today, the cost of acquiring a voter, as we saw from the Obama campaign and the Patrick campaign, is far less expensive. It's 1 30th the cost per acquiring a voter in old ways. So acquiring a new voter and mobilizing a voter through a text message is 1 30th as expensive as it is to do something with a telephone. 1 60th the cost that is, is doing it via direct mail. So it's brought the process together, not only are young people mobilizing, but smart governments and elected officials are using that technology to their own benefit as well. Is that, I mean, are those results published anywhere? I those seen. were published. That was a student perg study published uh, in 2007 and written about by a student here at the IOP in the New York Times uh, in 2008, um, Garrett Graff, who was uh, one of the first internet bloggers um, to uh, receive a White House credential, wrote a great op-ed piece citing that research back in 2008. So, Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, while John is sitting down, I'd like to sort of publicly acknowledge uh, him in our research. And, and uh, in, the, in the book, I had a very difficult choice. It was uh, when the book went in the can, and you could no longer change it, uh, John McCain was getting the Sarah Palin bump, and he was actually in the lead. And I wrote a whole chapter about Obama and all of this stuff, and essentially saying, here's why he won. And, um, and my publisher said, Don, you're a good guy, but you're crazy to do this. And, um, and I put in a little qualifier, you never know what can happen in politics, but I stuck uh, by my guns. A part of it was our research and, and the research from the Institute for Politics that said to me this social movement was going to um, be instrumental in bringing him to power. And fortunately uh, for the book, um, he won. For, it's fortunate that he won for other reasons from my point of view too. But. I think we're almost up. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I just had uh, two quick questions. My name's Alex Shirani. I'm a sophomore at the college uh, concentrating in government. And uh, I was wondering uh, to what extent you thought that the net generation would transform uh, the existing structure of government or simply participate more actively and in greater numbers within it. And uh, my second question was what concretely leaders can do. I know you said heads of state aren't the ones to look to for leadership, but what can leaders do concretely to sort of accelerate the trend? Should they accelerate the trend, and how would they do that? OK, um, they're uh, good questions. So um, the first one is in terms, of, um, in terms of how 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 will young people, will they work within the system, or will they go outside? Um, there, there are a lot of sides to this. First of all, to attract them, I think we need to change our our, our value proposition in many ways for, gov uh, for government, to, to win the war for talent. And they're a generation that's quite open to working for government. They don't have this negative view that governments are bad. So that's good. Um, in terms of uh, that's them as employees, them as consumers of government, we need to change the whole delivery system and the way that we get capability to create goods and services if we're going to uh, create services that satisfy them. And then as citizens, uh, what will happen? Will they go with our existing institutions or will they somehow go around? Will we see the rise of demonstrations and, and unrest in society? On that one, I'm of the view that the future is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And it depends big time on what governments around the world do. If they act in the traditional sort of uh, uh, a, a model of government that views citizens 
uh, citizen engagement is something that happens every four years, then I think we're going to have some big problems in society. If we see a change where these new models of engagement occur, we'll not only get more social harmony, we'll get better government. And, uh, we'll, get, um, and we'll get people uh, participating in ways that will be positive and good for society. Take something like climate change. Imagine a digital brainstorm on this topic. What would happen? You know, you'd have architects forming a little group about retrofitting, retrofitting old buildings and school kids. You get every school and a state involved and thinking about how we could um, you know, contribute as, as students to uh, cutting back on carbon emissions and how we could influence our parents and so on. People, initiatives would be catalyzed completely independent of what governments do. And this is the new model of the governance web. Citizens, governments, private companies, and civil society organizations, these sort of now four pillars of society, working together on networks to do things that weren't previously uh, possible. So um, the, the answer on that question is it depends. Do you think we'll see any pushing away of government or greater decentralization in that case? Well, some things. Um, will become more centralized, but in general, there is a dis distribution of power that's underway. I mean, that's the overall trend. And uh, people have power through knowledge, and at their fingertips now, entire populations have the most powerful tool ever for finding out what's really going on, for informing others, and even for organizing collective responses. And this is something, you know, and I talk to government leaders about, well, Boy, this sounds like a risky thing, letting go. You don't control the message anymore. Well, hello, you don't control the message anymore. This is not something that you're creating. This is part of reality. And so governments need to get comfortable with this concept that, that they don't control everything, that you have to have some confidence and, and belief in the population and in your citizenry to do the right thing. I mean, ultimately, you know, this is a reflection of everything that's good and bad in society, the, the new web. It's used to, to you know, help people organize to find a cure for, for AIDS. And it's also uh, used by, by evil people to do unspeakable acts. And it will be, ultimately, what we want it to be. And, um, and it, it cherishes this awesome neutrality compared to the, the traditional media that were one way, sort of, you could control the message, and they were centralized. Now this is highly distributed. Um, it's multi-way. And uh, the, the future is really something that we collectively will create. I'll just quickly comment on the leadership issue as well. You know, I think the old model of the leader, the great visionary, you know, in the private center, a sector, Lee Iacocca, you know, has a vision and sells it down. In government, Winston Churchill, you know, we will fight. And, um, well, the person at the top can't learn for the organization as a whole anymore. And this is not my insight. This is a guy named Peter Senge, who you would know well, wrote a book over two decades ago called The Fifth Discipline. And um, leadership can come from anywhere. And especially in this time where people can now come together and collaborate. So to me, that means that leadership is everybody's personal opportunity. It's not just Governor Patrick's opportunity. It's, it's your opportunity if you're a citizen um, in, in Massachusetts, that you can be a leader to help bring about positive change. Can we take one more? Yeah, OK. Uh, hi, my name's Casey Donovan. Um, I run a business called Clean Journey. Um, you answered almost every question I was going to ask. It's like a roving question that I've had in the last five minutes. <laughs> but I do have one, one other point. Um, the the uh, large gap between Gen X, uh, baby boomers, and then the net gen, what do you see happening to close that gap? You have these government agencies with the next three, four years, huge chunks of their, their agencies are going to be retiring. How do you see those gaps being closed uh, from the net gen and uh, moving forward? Well, this is an area where I do foresee some big conflict inside our institutions. Because here you have 
uh, biggest generation ever, coming into the workforce, 80 million of them in the US alone, they have this whole new culture of collaboration, of innovation, and customization, and speed, and, uh, and authentication, and so on. And uh, they bump up against Dilbert, Inc. And uh, they're all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, and we put them in a cubicle, and we try and supervise them. And we're creating this generational firewall in our organizations, in governments. Young people are coming to work for governments, and at their fingers, they have more powerful tools than exist in our most sophisticated governments. So what do we do? Rather than embracing these tools, rather than understanding that electronic mail is a great technology to send a thank you letter to one of your friend's parents, Rather than getting on board with social networks as the new operating system of business and wikis and jams and collaborative filtering and RSS feeds and all these 21st century tools that can transform collaboration for, for, for high performance and innovation, what do we do? We ban their tools. I was talking to the CIO of a state where the governor had banned Facebook for government employees. And I said, why did he do that? And the CIO said the governor felt that young people were wasting their time at work. And uh, to which I replied, well, if young people are wasting their time, is that a technology problem? Surely that's a management problem. It has to do with management and workflow and job design and motivation and, and procedures and so on. I said, what was the effect of banning Facebook? He said, well, everybody went to MySpace. <laughs> on this stage about a year ago, I was interviewing some young people. I don't know if any of you were here. And I asked a 26-year-old employee of a US federal government agency, what was the effect of banning Facebook at your agency? He had a different answer. He said, uh, it was the single most demoralizing thing that management ever did. It said to us, we don't understand your technology. We don't get collaboration. We don't understand your generation. And we don't trust you. We do the opposite of what we should be doing. So to overcome this generational firewall, I'm not saying that just because they're authorities on something really important means they're authorities on everything. There's lots that they have to learn as well. But we should be you know, having reverse or two-way mentoring programs. I now have four young people that I have a formal mentoring relationship. Every week, we collaborate. And they give me something new, and I try and give them some wisdom about what this might mean. And uh, it's a humbling thing to do that. They come into the workforce, and it's like, hi, welcome to a traditional government bureaucracy, Inc. I'm, a, I'm your boss, and a boss is someone who's an authority on everything in our business uh, unit or our department. And the young person's thinking, well, just a sec. I've been an authority on something really important since I was 11. I have a different view of authority. Why don't we all work together in teams where we each have our own kind of authority? And that's a huge challenge to the whole modus operandi of how government organizations work. So the, the future on this one, it's going to depend. But if we, don't, if, if we don't wake up and try and understand that in their culture is the new culture of work, then I think that uh, there will be uh, a great conflict in the workplace and, and, and we'll be doing a great disservice, not just to them, but, uh, but to everybody.